Okay, now we're gonna dig deeper into HPE Esmeral and try to better understand how it's gonna impact customers. And with me to do that are Robert Christensen, who's the Vice President of Strategy in the Office of the CTO, and Kumar Srikanti, who's the Chief Technology Officer and Head of Software, both, of course, with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thanks for coming on. Good seeing you, Dave. Thanks for having us. Yeah, always great, us. great to see you guys. And so, Esmeral, kind of an interesting name, catchy name. Uh, but, but Kumar, what exactly is HPE Esmeral? <laughs> yeah, it's indeed a catchy name. Our branding team done a fantastic job. I believe it's actually a derivative from Esmeralda, it's a Spanish for emerald. Apparently it's supposed to have some very mythical powers um, and they derived Esmeral from there. And we all actually, initially when we heard it, it was interesting. Um, so Esmeral was our effort to take all the software, the platform tools that HP has and provide this modern operating platform to the customers and put it under one brand. So it, it has a modern container platform, it has a persistent storage, distributed data fabric, and it has InfoSight that as many of our customers familiar with. So it's the, think of it as a, our container platform offering for modernization and digitization for the customers. Yeah, it's an interesting you talk about platform. So it's not, you know, a lot of times people think product, but you're positioning yeah. it as a platform. So it, <laughs> it has a broader implication. That's, that's very true. So, so as the customers are thinking of digitization and modernization, containers and microservices, as you know, there is, has, become the, has become the stable hold. So it's actually a container orchestration platform. It offers open source Kubernetes as well as a persistent storage bolted to it. So by the way, Esmeral, I think Emerald in Spain, I think in the culture it also has immunity powers as well. So immunity oh, from, <laughs> from lock-in and all those other terrible diseases <laughs> maybe helps us with COVID too. Rob, Robert, when you talk to customers, what problems do you probe for that, that Esmeral can, can do a good job solving? Yeah, they, that's a really great question because uh, a lot of times they don't even know what it is that they're trying to solve for other than just a very narrow use case. But the idea here is that to give them a platform by which they can bridge both the public and private environment for when they're doing application development, specifically in the data side. So when they're looking to bring containerization, which originally got started on the public cloud and has moved its way, I should say become uh, popular in the public cloud and has moved its way on premises now, uh, Esmeral really opens the door to three fundamental things. Like, you know, how do I maintain an open architecture like you're referring to, to some low or oh, no lock-in of my applications? And number two, how do I gain a data fabric or a data um, consistency of accessing a data so I don't have to rewrite those applications when I do move them around? And then lastly, where, where everybody is heading now, the real value is in the AI ML initiatives that companies are are really bringing that value of their data and locking the data at where the data is being generated and stored. And so the Esmeral platform is those multiple pieces that Kumar was talking about stacked together that deliver those solutions for the client. So Kumar, what's the, you know, how does it work? What's the sort of IP or the secret sauce behind it all? What makes HPE different? Yeah, continuing our theme of mythical powers around Esmeral, it's a modern platform for optimizing the um, data intensive workloads. That I think it, I would say there are three unique characteristics of this platform. Number one is it actually provides you both an ability to run stateful and stateless workloads mm -hmm. under the same platform. And number two is as we were thinking about, unlike an analog Kubernetes open source, it actually gives you all open source Kubernetes as well as an orchestration behind it. So you can actually do it. We can provide this hybrid um, thing that Robert was talking about. And then actually we built the workflows into it. That's for example, we have actually announced along with it, a Esmeral MLOps platform that customers can actually do the workflow management around specifically data intensive workloads. So the, the magic is if you want to see it, secrets of it, all the efforts that have been gone into some of the IP acquisitions that HP has done over the years, we saw we blue data, map bar, and the, the nimble info side, all these pieces are coming together and providing a modern digitization platform for the customers. So these pieces, they, they all have a little bit of machine intelligence in them. You know, people, we used to think of AI as this sort of separate thing. I mean, the same thing with containers, mm -hmm. right? But now it's getting embedded in, into the stack. What, what is the role of machine intelligence or machine learning in, in Esmeral? 
Oh, I, I, I would take a step back and say, you know this very well there, the customers, data, amount of data that is being generated and 95% or 98% of the data is machine generated. And it has a serious amount of gravity and it is sitting at the edge. And we are the, we are the only one that have edge to the cloud data fabric that is built into it. So the number one is that we are bringing computer or cloud to the data, then taking the data to the cloud, right? So if you will, right? it's a cloud-like experience that provides the customer. AI is not much value to us if we don't harness the data. So I've, I said this in one of the blog posts, we have gone from collecting the data era to the finding the insights into the data, right? So that people have used all sorts of uh, analysis that, that we are to find data is the new oil. So the AI and the data, and then now your applications have to be modernized. And nobody wants to write an application in a non-microservices fashion because you want to build the modernization. So if you bring these three things, I want, I have a data gravity, I have lots of data. I had to build in AI applications and I want to have an hybrid. Those three things I think we bring together to the customers. So, so Robert, let's stay on customers for a minute. I mean, you know, I want to understand the business impact, the business case. I mean, it's why should all the, you know, the cloud developers have all the fun? You mentioned it. <laughs> you're bridging the cloud and on-prem. Uh, talk about when you talk to customers and what they are seeing as the business impact. What's the real drivers for them? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, at the end of the day, I think the recent survey that was that cost and performance are still the number one requirement for this dis real close second is agility, the speed at which they want to move. And so those two are the top of mind every time. But uh, the thing we find in Esmeral, which is so uh, impactful, is that nobody brings together the silicon, the hardware, the platform, and all that stack together to work and combine like Esmeral does with the platforms that we have and specifically you know, when we start getting 90, 92, 93% utilization out of AI ML workloads on very expensive hardware, it really, really is a competitive advantage over a public cloud offering, which does not offer those kind of services. And the cost models are so significantly different. So we do that by collapsing the stack. We take out as much intellectual property, excuse me, um, as much software pieces that are necessary so we are closest to the silicon, closest to the applications bring it to the, the hardware itself, meaning that we can interleave the applications, meaning that you can get to true multi-tenancy on a particular platform that allows you to deliver a cost-optimized solution. So when you talk about the money side, absolutely. There's just nothing out there. And then on the second side, which is agility, um, one of the things that we know is today is that applications need to be built in pipelines, right? This is something that's, that's been established now for quite some time. Now that's really making its way on premises. And what Kumar was talking about was how do we modernize? How do we do that? Well, there's going to be some that you want to break into microservices and containers, and there's some that you don't. Now, the ones that they're going to do that, they're going to get that speed and motion, et cetera, out of the gate, and they're going to put that on premises, which is relatively new these days to the on-premises world. So we think both will, will be the advantage. Okay, I want to unpack that a little bit. So you, the cost is clear, you, really 90 plus percent utilization. I mean, Kamar, yes. you know, <laughs> even, even pre-virtualization, we know what it was like. Even with virtualization, you never really got that high. I mean, people would talk about it, but are you really able to sustain that uh, in, in real world workloads? Yeah, I, I think when you, I, I think when you, when you make your, your exchangeable currency into small pieces, you can insert them into many areas. And we have one customer was running 18 containers on a single server. And each of those containers, as, as you know, early days of Blue Data, we actually modernized what we consider we run containers as micro VMs. <clears throat> so if you actually build these microservices and you have all anti-affinity rules and you have provisioning formulas all correctly, you can pack, bin pack these things extremely well. And we have seen this, again, it's not a guarantee. It all depends on your application and your, I mean, as an engineer, we want to always understand how these caveats work. But it is a very modern utilization of the platform with the data. And once you know where the data is, and then it becomes very easy to match those two. Now, the other piece of the value proposition that I heard, Robert, is it's it, it basically an integrated stack. So I don't have to cobble together a bunch of open source components. 
Um, right. It's there, it, uh, there's, there's legal implications, there's obviously performance implications. Uh, that's, I would imagine that resonates, particularly with the enterprise buyer, because they don't have the time to do all this integration. That's a very good point. So there is an interesting, um, um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, question that enterprises, they want to have an open source, so there is no lock-in, but they also need help to implement and deploy and manage it because they don't have the expertise. And we all know that K8S has actually brought that API, the past layer standardization. So what we have done is we have given the open source, and you write to the Kubernetes API, but at the same time, orchestration, persistent storage, the data fabric, the AI algorithms, all of them are bolted into it. And on the top of that, it's available both as a licensed software on run on-prem and the same software runs on the Green Lake. So you can actually pay as you go and you don't, and the, we run it for them in, in a colo or, or in their own data center. Oh, good. I, I was, that, was, that was one of my latter questions. So, so I can get this as a service, pay by the That's drink, correct. essentially. I don't have to yes. install a yes. bunch of stuff on-prem and, and pay and a perpetual fact, license if I choose. Container as a service and MLOps as a service in the last Discover and then now it's gone production. So both MLOps is available. You can run it on-prem on the top of Esmeral uh, container platform or you can run inside the green light. Robert, are there any specific use case patterns that you see emerging am amongst customers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. There's a couple of them. So <clears throat> we have a, a really nice relationship that we see with um, any of the uh, Splunk operators that were out there today, right? So Splunk containerized their operator. That operator is the number one operator, for example, for Splunk um, in the IT operation side for notifications as well as on the security operation side. So we found that that runs highly effective on top of Esmeral, on top of uh, our platforms that we just talked about with it, uh, Kumar just talked about. But I want to also give a little bit of backgrounds to that same operator uh, platform. The way that the Esmeral platform is done is that we've been able to make highly active active what we call HA availability at nine, excuse me, at five nines for that same Splunk operator on premises on the Kubernetes open source, which is, as far as I'm concerned, very, very high end uh, computer science work. If you understand how difficult that is. Uh, that's number one. Number two is you'll see Spark, just a Spark workloads as a whole, all right? Nobody handles Spark workloads like we do. So we put a container around them and we put them inside the uh, pipeline of moving people through that basic uh, uh, ML AI pipeline of getting a model through its system, through its train, and then actually deployed to our ML ops pipeline. This is a key fundamental for delivering value in the data space as well. And then lastly, this is this is really important. When you think about the data fabric that we offer, um, the data fabric itself uh, doesn't necessarily have to be bolted with the container platform. The container, the actual data fabric itself um, can be deployed underneath a number of our, you know, for competitive platforms who don't handle data well. We know that, we know that they don't handle it very well at all. And we get lots and lots of calls for people to say, hey, can you take your Esmeral data fabric and solve my uh, large scale, highly you know, challenging data problems? We say, yeah, and then when you're ready for a real world, full time, enterprise ready container platform, we'd be happy to prove that too. So you're saying, you're, you're, if I'm inferring correctly, you're, you're, one of the values is you're simplifying that whole data pipeline and the whole data yeah. science, science project, pun intended, I guess. Okay, <laughs> that's true. <clears throat> So yeah, absolutely. So where where does a customer start? I mean, what what are the engagements like? Um, what's the starting point? HP is probably one of the most trusted enterprise supplier for many many years, and we have a phenomenal workforce of the both the our point next is one of the leading world leading support organization. There are many places to start with, right? One is obviously all these services are available on the Green Lake, as you, we just talked about and they can start on a pay-as-you-go basis. We have many customers that actually, some are grandfather from the early days of Blue Data and MapR, and they're already running, and they actually improvise on when, as they move into their next generation modernization. Um, you can start with simple Esmeral container platform with, or system, with a store of compute storage operation and can implement as, as little as 10 nodes and to start working with. Um, and and finally, there is a 
as a, as a big company like HPE, as an enterprise company with the point next services, it's very easy for the customers to be able to get that support on the day two operations. Thank you for yeah. watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. Keep it right there for more great content from Esmeralda.